you so much to uh, Jennifer and to the BITS community for having me here today. I'm here to talk about weighted false discovery rates for improving social science inference. This is joint work with another graduate student at Stanford, Bradley Spahn. And uh, we, uh, our motivating problem is that social scientific data sets accommodate many, many ways of analyzing data. We have uh, multiple treatments. I'm just going to step off. We have multiple treatment arms and numerous covariates that are collected uh, for experiments. Um, in surveys, we have dozens, typically, or even hundreds of questions that we could potentially analyze. And we uh, can also think of various measures or indices to use as dependent or independent variables. Often, um, we're in a world where uh, we want to measure things in many different ways, and we could either use these items individually or we could construct scales. There's, in other words, a lot of researcher degrees of freedom when we are analyzing uh, both observational and experimental data in social science. Um, and, and of course, researchers themselves have many hypotheses that they would like to test, uh, which of course can be, uh, you could think of this as hypothesis trolling in a pre-analysis plan setting, um, but it could also be that it's, uh, that you're being led uh, by uh, multiple theories that have uh, sort of conflicting um, predictions. So uh, our motivating question then is how can we avoid capitalizing on chance? In other words, how can we make sure that we aren't just selecting the green jelly beans? And uh, of course today we've already talked about quite a bit about the credibility crisis in, in social science, not just in political science. Uh, this, uh, the classic form of publication bias that everyone is, is sort of familiar with is the file drawer problem where many s studies that are similar are conducted, but only those that have novel findings end up in print. Uh, but there are, of course, other forms of publication bias, and so some of them are, for example, selection, uh, uh, selective reporting of outcomes, where you uh, do test many of these hypotheses, but only the ones that are statistically significant get reported. Alternatively, selective reporting of design elements, where you might have many treatments, many conditions, but only those that give you significant results are revealed, and those that, are, that do not are concealed. This is... Uh, we define the first problem of publication bias more generally as a, a breathwise bias and selective reporting as deathwise bias. In other words, this is when researchers engage in cr questionable research practices um, with their own data and their own results. And it's this one that we focus on today. Uh, ooh, okay, well. You can't see this image, but it's actually going to be very similar to this one. This is, uh, these are findings from another paper uh, that I published with two of my other collaborators, Neil Mahotra and Gabor Samanovitz, where we looked at, uh, we looked at the registry of studies conducted uh, through time-sharing experiments in the social sciences. And one of the advantages of using this registry is that we had access to the survey questionnaires. Now, in most cases, it's hard for us to back out what exactly researchers did when they went to run their experiment, how they, how they designed it, how they analyzed it. We often don't have access to research proposals or the full materials, and in this case, we did. This was one of the advantages of working with the test data, and we were able to compare the number of outcomes and the number of experimental conditions that were actually implemented um, or executed as part of the survey and asked of respondents to the ones that appeared in the published versions of those experiments. And what we found is that although quite a few, uh, quite a few studies, quite a few researchers will fully report the number of conditions and the number of uh, dependent variables that they measured, uh, we found pretty extensive underreporting, um, and these are, you know, questions that we thought were plausibly affected by treatment, but that ultimately did not make it into the paper. We can talk about reasons why that might happen. We don't think that researchers are acting necessarily in bad faith, um, but of course this is problematic because it does mean that we could very well just be reading about the green jelly beans in the literature. Um, for we conducted this this type of analysis for both political science and psychology, but for the psychology experiments, reviewers really pushed us to go further and reanalyze the data and actually see if re reporting was selective. If it wasn't just simply that people were not reporting something that they might publish later on, but actually that 
those were insignificant findings or you know with small effect sizes and what we found is that actually that it ha does happen to be the case um, although the distribution of p-values for that are that do not get reported right for these outcomes that don't um, that are that are not discussed in the papers uh, the, that distribution uh, just looks flat right but if you look at the effect sizes that are tied to those uh, findings where they are significant we find that they're much, much smaller compared to the ones that actually make it into the papers. Um, so our, our search and selectivity contrary to the scientific method. Uh, we believe that uh, significant results are a valuable contribution to scientific knowledge. Um, there's a reason why we care of, about them and so they're usually of interest. Uh, but as more hypotheses are tested, then there's a greater possibility that you know, chance discoveries will masquerade as real findings. Um, just to illustrate this, uh, you know, for a, for a moment, the probability of, of rejecting, uh, you know, n number of hypotheses that you test um, that uh, are, are, are given by this binomial CDF. And, you know, the probability of making a rejection when you're just testing two null hypotheses is almost double the nominal rate. It's almost 0.1. So this is a problem, and how extensive is this problem in political science? Um, so this is data we, we have, thankfully, other political scientists have collected data on the uh, number of hypotheses tests that people have uh, conducted. This is data um, from 1995 to 2013 collected by Neil Mahotra, Justin Isuri, and collaborators. And uh, what do we see? We see actually that the number of tests that political scientists are conducting is pretty high. Um, the, the method of data collection uh, differed for each of these surveys, but what we were interested in was what proportion of the tests that are conducted, and we have the p-values, actually still get rejected um, when we adjust for using different corrections or different thresholds. And so we see that uh, a pretty high proportion, even when you're testing 20, 30, 40 hypotheses, a pretty high proportion of those tests are uh, rejections when you, set, when you set the threshold at P less than 0.05. Controlling the family-wise error rate, this is a pretty well-known procedure, the uh, Bonferroni correction, is, uh, is one potential way to correct for this, but this is too restrictive, right? So it's been shown to be underpowered. It doesn't scale with the number of hypotheses tested. And uh, this, of course, is problematic, um, especially for researchers who are working with, really, with uh, very few observations. Um, we see, as a matter of fact, that the proportion of uh, hypotheses that get rejected when we adjust for, you apply the Bonferroni adjustment within each study is much lower uh, than originally. Um, but this doesn't really reflect the preferences of most scientists who would presumably ex be willing to exchange more false discoveries in exchange for more overall discoveries. And so a good compromise is controlling the false discovery rate, which is the expected proportion of rejected null hypotheses that are truly null. And, uh, and we do believe that this is a more appropriate error to control. Um, it's, we know that it scales with the number of hypotheses, uh, for example, and so this is um, somewhere, this is a good compromise. This is somewhere in between the number, the proportion of rejections uh, at using the Bonferroni threshold and unadjusted. Um, but this also does not reflect researchers' utility. And so what do we mean by that? Uh, Researchers often want to test many hypotheses. Some are of more interest than others. You can think of uh, being more interested in the uh, average treatment effect um, rather than a subgroup analysis. And uh, this is often one concern that has been raised with, with pre-registration and writing pre-analysis plans is that you could just say, I'm going to throw the kitchen sink here. I'm going to test every hypothesis, uh, every hypothesis that I can think of, and nothing is stopping me from specifying hundreds or dozens, um, other than the fact that the, the field would frown upon that, right? Because we, uh, well, I like to think that theory actually does play an important role, and um, it, it goes against the spirit of, uh, of using and implementing pre-analysis plans. So we propose that controlling a weighted false discovery rate is actually the best choice in the setting. Um, 
like I said, uh, theory is important, but it can contribute to FDR controlling procedures. And how can it do this? Uh, through the control of a weighted false discovery rate that can signal the relative importance of the hypotheses that you're testing. Uh, okay, so, uh, um, so, so the expected uh, Q here is, stands for the expected proportion of rejected null hypotheses. And uh, uh, the, basically, the, I kind of wish I had shown this to you for the false discovery rate. It's, it should be much easier. Um, essentially, what we're saying is that when, uh, so R stands for the number of rejections that are truly null. And when there are no null, there are no hypotheses that are truly null. In other words, all of, our, all of the tests that we're conducting are actually um, potentially true discoveries, then the weighted false, the false discovery rate and the weighted false discovery rate are zero. But when uh, we're in a world where um, many of those hypotheses are null, and we are, what we want to do is we want to control uh, V, the proportion of those rejections that are truly null, or uh, V divided by R. And we want to weight each of those rejections by the importance that we place on them. We, uh, the rule for rejection here would be we reject K, the number of, hypothe the number of tests, uh, for which the p-value exceeds a particular threshold. And we do this by ordering the p-values according to their size and rejecting when they fall above a line. And I can give a graphical intuition for this. Here uh, we see all four of the procedures that I, ha that I have just described. Um, the, dot dat the dotted line is set for p less than 0.05. The dot dash line is, represents the Bonferroni threshold. The, dot, uh, the dashed line is the uh, unweighted benjamini hochberg procedure. And the uh, solid line represents this weighted false discovery rate procedure. Here, the, the points in the plot correspond to p-values. Uh, this is just an example. This is not from an actual study. Uh, and the, the points have been sized according to the weight that we assign to them. And so uh, this is just for illustration purposes. But what we can see is that the fourth hypothesis in this example has been given greater weight than all others. You can think of that as maybe your main treatment effect or a top level uh, test that is the one that you're primarily concerned with. And we've assigned much of the weight there. Um, and uh, accordingly, the rejection threshold uh, is less restrictive around that point. But in the limit, it's just as restrictive as these other methods, and you're still controlling the false discovery rate at the, at the level that you chose. Um, this is, these are methods that have been popularized in genomics. But of course, in, in, uh, you know, geneticists don't really care about differences between genes, whereas we do actually care um, when we're making simultaneous comparisons ab about the relative importance of one over the other. Uh, so here, um, I'm going to talk about three use cases very quickly. One is pre-registered settings, right? Weights allow flexibility and actually encourage transparency, um, allowing researchers to engage in multiple testing, but also to signal to the scientific community about which ones are the ones that they actually believe. And you could think of a, an example where you assign much of the weight to hypotheses for which you have explicit predictions. Um, and you assign lower weight to the ones where you don't, but you still include them in your testing procedures and in your corrections. And in this way, you are avoiding capitalizing on chance by just simply testing everything and um, potentially choosing what to present post hoc. Uh, of course, weights can be ad hoc, but they can't be post hoc. And if you're specifying them in advance, you have a lot of freedom, but if you're specifying them after the fact, then uh, we actually would not, we have a different suggestion for what to do there. Um, but in a pre-registered setting, especially if you're using a data escrow service, you can define, you can define it however you want. Um, you, what you want to do is consider the minimal p-value thresholds that you're willing to subject your hypotheses to. Uh, and so the weights that you would set would be e equivalent to, um, you know, asking yourself maybe, would I accept 
a rejection at PLSM.04 if my hypothesis uh, was, was ordered lowest um, in exchange for rejecting hypotheses at P equals 0 0.0025 if it turns out that my main hypotheses are actually ranked higher and many of the other ones that I care about are ranked lower. Of course, how to specify weights is, a, is sort of the question that we receive every time we present this. And uh, initially, we had suggested that we had suggested the community talking about what should be default weights for studies. Um, but then we realized that actually there's a lot of the arbitrariness is actually good, right? So again, weights are ad hoc, but they wouldn't be post hoc. Um, if you're really at a loss for how to do this, some, an example that we, uh, this is sort of the, the uh, scheme that we suggested, which is to give, uh, give hypotheses that are better powered, more positive weight, and to have the weights be a decreasing function of the level of interaction. And this is just a very simple approach, but of course it can be far more flexible and it is up to the discretion of the researcher. Um, so uh, we also suggest excluding underpowered hypotheses from weighted procedures. This is, a, this is often a problem that we shouldn't be testing them at all is our argument, not, uh, not necessarily that they deserve zero weight. Um, and uh, what is a hypothesis, right? So this is difficult to define, but if you would include a test of the null hypothesis in a paper, we think that it should count. Um, and of course, you should think in terms of worst case scenarios. If your treatment is uh, not as large as you uh, guessed it would be, what is the paper that you could write? Um, so uh, like I said, before you touch the data, you have a lot of freedom in defining weights and assigning weights. Um, and this is one way forward if you wanna do that. Uh, but after you've seen the data, we would suggest using an unweighted procedure. Um, this is an example from an observational uh, study by Chantal Iyengar, um, Harry Hahn, and Krosnick. And uh, here, uh, the goal of the study was to look at the effects of partisan selectivity versus issue selectivity when um, encountering campaign information. And so what they did was they sent CDs to, uh, to respondents that included campaign materials and information, and they recorded which chapters and which types of information those respondents chose to, or those participants chose to read. Um, here, uh, they were primarily interested in partisan selectivity as issue selectivity was something that had been tested and was, up to that point at least, had more uh, evidence behind it. Um, so here, as an example, I'm weighting partisan the tests of partisan selectivity more heavily. And what we can see is that if we apply these, uh, if we apply the, um, if we apply the unweighted benjamini hochberg procedure, we actually do reject all but two of the tests. But if we apply a weighted procedure in which the, in which we're giving greater weight to those uh, tests that the researchers actually cared about, we see that it's actually a little bit more restrictive because they're, um, those p-values are actually ranked higher. And so this is an example where it's actually pretty hard to game this procedure, and it can actually, uh, it, it could actually hurt you in some cases if you, um, if you believe that that is a, you know, risk that we're willing to take. Uh, here I put, like, I think I weighted partisan selectivity maybe six times greater. So this is, you know, I'm putting a lot of weight um, these dots are proportional, but they're, you know, if, if they were strictly uh, linearly proportional, then those dots would be a lot larger. Um, use, it's hard to game, it, uh, it's hard to game this procedure and say I'm going to put all of the weight on my hypotheses just to ensure that and guarantee that they get rejected. Uh, we see that that's just simply not the case. And then finally, the uh, use case number three. So what if you suspect and we're reporting in a paper? Right? How can we apply this retroactively? And initially, we thought of writing this paper as how to read a paper. Um, are the results still believable if we take into account multiple testing? Um, one way to do this would be to make a guess about the number of hypotheses that were tested but not reported in the paper. Another, and just assume that those were insignificant. Um, and then uh, back out the number of hypotheses that would be that would be rejected if we, uh, 
if we either you could um, you could imagine a world in which you give different hypotheses different weights, or you could just weight them all equally, in which case you're just applying a regular benjamin hochberg threshold. Um, but alternatively, you could find the number of unreported hypotheses that are necessary to overturn the results. So how many hypotheses would be would someone have had to exclude or how many would they have had to test in order for us no, to no longer believe a particular result? Um, and what we found is that for some studies, that number can be incredibly high. It could be 75, it could be 100 and we're still relatively confident that the results would hold. Um, so just to conclude, uh, we think that any solution to resolving this multiple comparisons problem should actually adhere to certain principles um, that are uh, relevant in social science and the way that we conduct um, we conduct research, which is first, like I said, no, hap no capitalizing on chance. We should uh, consider the problem of multiple comparisons to be uh, on par with this other classic file drawer problem um, of, of publication bias. In fact, uh, it's possible that depthwise bias is uh, potentially more, a more pernicious and problematic form of publication bias. Uh, not all hypotheses are equal. We don't treat them equally, therefore our inferential procedures should not treat them equally. Uh, we recommend upweighting more important hypotheses to account for, um, to account for researchers' preferences and utilities. And uh, we should also minimize degrees of freedom. Uh, weights should not be post hoc. And in a non-pre-registered setting, or maybe in a forensic analysis, we should just simply apply um, the uh, control the false discovery rate, the unweighted false discovery rate. Uh, we we don't think that researchers act in bad faith, um, and we do think that if we were to standardize some of these practices, that uh, account for, to, if we were to incentivize and establish practices that um, require people to account for the tests that they've conducted, that they will do so truthfully. Thank you.